Good. I would have been copyright removed for the Bert part. Um, Darwin was deeply interested in pigeon breeding. And humans used to breed. You've probably heard of the carrier pigeon. That was uh, famous for events in World War II in which you carry little secret messages around uh, from person to person. Um, we have actually completely extinct. Uh, some of them are most useful breeds of pigeon for that reason because they were used so often and they weren't bred. Um, we also bred them for meat. Um, you will see some old movies where there's, you know, they're in New York and it's classic. that They have a pigeon coop. On top of their building, lots of people did. You could breed them like chickens and get meat out of them, or they just liked them. And they would breed them, and they would be judged based on their plumage like we would have dog shows today. So one of the reasons uh, um, Darwin's theory of evolution came about is he already knew that humans were modifying plants and animals. And not because he grew up on a farm. As we've said before, he grew up in a very wealthy family. Uh, he didn't really get his hands dirty in that kind of way. But he really liked breeding pigeons. And there's a few different types of pigeons to show from an old book of the types of things that they would breed with Big, f colorful fronts. These are black and white drawings. So when I say colorful, it doesn't make sense. But ones with tail feathers that look a bit like peacocks. People got really carried away with it. Um, a pigeon is actually a type of uh, dove. So all of them came from one species, the wild rock dove. Um, I like to refer to them as flying rats because that's what they are. Um, pigeons will eat anything. If they could fit small children in their mouths, they probably would. Um, and they took that one dove and turned it into hundreds of breeds. That was all Darwin was familiar with. He didn't really grow up on a farm. We've, we've done that, obviously, with farming. Um, a, a modern cow doesn't look anything like the bovine it came from. Um, modern carrots look completely different from the ancestral carrot. Uh, we bred a lot of things for traits that we wanted, but he was familiar with pigeons. Racing, pigeon races used to be a thing. So humans identified some traits. Oh, that pigeon has slightly different colors on its feathers. I really like that. So I'm going to breed that pigeon with this other pigeon. See if I get more of that. And if I get more of that, I'm going to breed those children together. And then breed those children together again until all I see is that trait. And then I'll try and breed back in some of the other genes in order to um, make sure that that trait sticks around. Desirable. Is that how you spell desirable? Desireable. There we go. And many of those hundreds of pigeons that he was familiar with weren't even bred for something useful, like meat. Uh, I, I couldn't find, I don't think they ever bred them for eggs. Um, we are um, uh, lucky to have chicken eggs. The eggs of most other species are not nearly as nice as chicken eggs. They're a lot harder, a lot rubber, rubberier. Um, and chickens haven't even been bred that much. Their eggs haven't changed consistency in a fairly long time. Uh, but we don't know their origin. That uh, domestication, I think, happened fairly early. Um, now, I'm glossing over it here. It's not quite in your notes. Only breeding together the pigeons that best displayed... So if you had a mutation, 
you try and breed that that species that that individual to many others try to see if you can get that trait to come back out again if you can where is that trait going to pop up in the children so the ones that have the trait are the children so this is a very common thing that breeders do is you breed the children with the traits together you keep doing that until that trait is really strong in that population and then you can do what's called breed out you bring in other individuals into it so because if you've been breeding the children together there's probably a lot of unwanted traits by this time as long as that trait is being now passed down very strongly you try and get rid of the bad traits uh, and keep in with the good ones you can even pick traits that are terrible how many of you have seen or owned a pug? Okay. What's wrong with the pug? Their faces. Pardon? Their faces. Their faces. Yeah, we, we've taken an animal who, that has a long nose and we've shrunken the nose right up to the face to the point that their eyes pop out. If they're bred properly, their, their eye sockets are not big enough to hold their eyes. And if you even look the, at, at uh, pictures, uh, drawings in many cases from the 18th century, um, and then even pictures of pugs from even 50 years ago, they don't actually quite, we've really bred it in the last uh, 50 to 75 years. Um, we're very good at picking the traits we want and then doing it. So a little diagram of this process. We have our first generation. Let's say we want some very large pigeons. Who should we breed together in this first generation? Which ones are the largest? The middle kind of the middle ones. I think that one looks pretty big. It looks higher. And that one looks pretty big. So that'll be the F1 generation. Now we have the F2 generation here. All their children. Who should we breed, to, uh, breed together? We have one, two, three, four, five. Two and five. Two and five look big. Four and six. Four and six. So breed those two together. And eventually we get in the F3 generation, we now have a more consistent. Now, by chance, we're breeding for tallness, but they also, they also got darker because it just so happened. Those genes might be on the same chromosome. Maybe they're linked. Or maybe it just was happenstance and that one also got concentrated. It doesn't take long. Um, to get a genetically different uh, um, uh, population. Evolution takes a long time, adaptation, um, but it is amazing. It is on the time scale of the species. So for humans, one generation is estimated 25 years um, because that's how much it takes to get another uh, group going. Um, but if you have something that, that even on that scale, you can, you can take an animal within recorded history of humans see rapid changes uh, if you pick a particular trait. Um, I'll show you some pictures a little later on of the, of the worst plant that exists that humans actually bred to be the most evil plant. Yeah. So this is known as artificial selection. Artificial selection is, of course, distinct from natural selection. Natural selection, Darwin's great leap was recognizing that what happens with humans could also happen in nature. So in one sense, because we already understood, talk to any farmer, they already understood the basic practices of breeding. You took animals who had traits you liked, that cow gives off great milk, that bull is the son of another cow that gives off great milk, gives off a lot of milk, let's breed them together. They've been doing that for generations. So humans should have gone down here yeah. and we do that by choosing who lives and who dies so I mentioned the Russian uh, scientist who took a fox um, pelt 
um, a farm up in Siberia and he essentially bred dogs within a few generations. It was amazing how rapidly he was able to do it. Typical foxes, fox colors, fox pointed ears, fox temperament, snappy, bitey, afraid of humans, few generations, spotted coats, floppy ears, um, friendly towards humans. Um, how many of you have ever met an actual British bulldog? What's their temperament like? Was it a friendly dog? Yeah. They were originally bred to be guard dogs, and they were vicious. Um, and then in the 1960s and 70s, they became really popular with little old ladies in Britain. And so the snappy ones never got bought. So the breeders changed their breeding program so their temperament was a lot more friendly. British Bulldogs nowadays, very friendly dogs. Um, now, if you apply this to humans, it's called eugenics. I just want you to know that if you're ever in an argument and your solution is eugenics, you are always wrong. We'll leave that a little bit to the social studies class. But sometimes after learning about this, certain students go, well, maybe we could improve. No, no, that is a bad path. It's been trod before and it's always gone wrong. So you already have an example of a process that's very similar to natural selection um, because it's still based on the differences in survival. And we can make it happen quite quickly because humans can be m fairly ruthless, whereas in nature... There's a lot of different niches and solutions that will kind of work for the animal. Maybe they won't have as many children, but maybe they'll still have a few, and so traits can pass on. But if you're a human, you'll say, well, none of that one. That's terrible. This one's so good, we're going to breed all of them together, including all of their children. We're going to make sure that trait. So humans can accelerate this process a fair bit. And if we are selecting for traits, now for a long time, of course, the farmer's doing this, didn't understand what they were working with. They're just looking at visible traits. But what underneath that are they actually changing? What are the traits from? What's the name for that? Alleles. Alleles. And that is the definition uh, um, of evolution is that you have a permanent allele change in a population. So if you have allele drift in which you have a change, allele drift is in the wrong, uh, right wording for that, sorry. That's actually a whole separate section. Um, but if you have alleles becoming more common and other ones dying out, that is the definition of what evolution is. So what is really the only difference between evolution and artificial selection? Over. How fast it happens? Um, that it, I just said that that was a difference. Um, and humans are usually faster, but they can also be kind of slow too. You can get rapid evolutionary change if it's happening on a scale in which uh, um, uh, those that don't fit the right niche are getting wiped out. We're actually seeing rapid evolutionary change right now. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but you are sitting in the middle of one of the largest extinction events in Earth's history. Um, in some estimates, it's been faster um, than the um, uh, one that was caused by the meteor. That one apparently was gradual over generations, but now that we've been cutting down forests, ours are pretty quick. So speed would be one way to tell it apart, um, in many cases. Because they're being selected, and where the natural world might not be the case. 
Yeah, I think yes, but explain. So, I mean, you know, humans choose things. Humans are choosing, yeah. yeah. And in nature? Animals are choosing, and choices might, <laughs> their choices might be different. <laughs> Close? Yeah. So the main one is in an artificial, there's someone who is choosing. By the way, we're not the only ones who do this. We thought we were, but it turns out ants breed aphids for their nectar. We're not entirely sure if they, like ants are a complex network and it's useful to think of an ant hive as an entire brain because although they act individually as, as unintelligent ants, as a whole, they seem to do some very smart things. And they seem to encourage certain aphid groups to give off more nectar to mate. So we might not be the only species that encourages breeding. Um, but when it's done that way, it is either adaptation to fit the niche, but there's nobody selecting. There's no choice in there. It's just an algorithm. But with humans doing the selecting, that's the main difference. Santiago, can you take the... Um, Ears up. So and this is how we can get things that are very much not geared for survival. If you are breeding a dog for its looks, and not for its ability to survive, you can get dogs where their eyes pop out if you look at them wrong. The pugs, uh, um, German shepherds, are really known for their hip problems because when you look at a German shepherd, breeding, you wanted that nice shape that where it sloped down like this and the hips went down like that. It's very common for a German shepherds in terms of its breeding for its hips to be destroyed later on in life just as a natural progress. They don't have strong hips. Um, and so breeders are always trying to combat these problems while still getting that look. But part of the problem is that look requires a certain shape of hips or face or nose or anything else. Uh, so, got a little spot here for a diagram. We have virtual. So true in both, we have a type of selection process. That selection chooses, which is kind of a bad word because in the natural selection, the choosing is just accidents that happen in nature. You weren't quite fast enough, you became someone else's dinner. Um, you weren't quite fast enough, you weren't able to catch dinner. Um, and then so that chooses which alleles become more common. The only real difference is that we'd go here and we just almost jump the process with humans choosing. Oh, sorry. Oh, I was doing the wrong screen. What is which word? Sorry, say it again. What's that word between selection and variation? Oh, chooses. Oh, while you're doing that, I should probably also do.
Dudley? Why do you have your purple tape propped up? Are you trying to trap a small bird? Or put your phone in there? Let's put that away and put your phone down. I'm Hussein, yeah. Ayana, yeah. Asha, yeah. Besma, yeah. Charlie, yeah. Elena O, <laughs> Elena F, yeah. uh, Felix, yeah. Jack, yeah. Milia, yeah. Luke, Manuel, not here, Nika, yeah. Araya, yeah. Portia, yeah. Rowan, yeah. Santiago, you have to say here, Santiago, excellent, Savannah, Sierra, yeah. Sophie, yeah. Soren, yeah. Wilbur, yeah. Yash. Excellent. Okay. Labeling this process. We're the original population. Maybe one of Darwin's, uh, one of, uh, you get a finch. In this case, we have the proud and majestic gray wolf. We apply a selection pressure. With the finch that's been blown to the Galapagos Islands, it's going to be a natural selection. Can it eat the seeds? What seeds are available? As the population expands and the food gets used up, what other source of food's on there? And here we have humans. Come, eat some of my uh, uh, the um, food we have by the fire, and maybe you'll bark and wake us up when there's predators nearby. Um, dogs are, or wolves are the earliest domestication we have evidence for. Um, they have been with us for so long. It's hard to put in towards. We are finding connections that we think might be built into our biology to respond to dogs. What? Selection pressure. Like queen. Pressure. Um, dogs will mimic a lot of human facial expressions because we've been living with them for so long, they've adapted those instincts into themselves. Um, uh, dogs that have a more recent wolf ancestry, because there's some species that do, the husky I think is an example, uh, in which um, they were um, not descended from the gray wolf, but some other ones and, and adapted. Sometimes some things are just not there in the way that these are. They, the dog domestication is very old, uh, which is why I hate them. They are spies among us, and who knows what they're going to be getting up to. And then you get a genetically different population. Because you have the majestic gray wolf, and then you have this thing. Like... And there's that, which is this little tiny wiener dog. And then you have a Great Dane. If you put them next to each other, tell me they're not different species. Could they even mate if they wanted to? Probably not. I would hate to see a dash hound impregnated by a Great Dane. The puppies that would come out. Would they be too big? Would they kill the poor wiener dog? We have managed to breed a huge variety for a, a number of tasks from just being weird pets, which I, I don't actually, I can't say this didn't have a job. A lot of dogs that I thought were just weird pets because they're small and cute actually turned out to be ratters. Um, rats, uh, particularly if you go back in time uh, to modern day, um, were quite big and cats couldn't fight them. Rats could kill cats. Uh, cats keep down mice. Dogs take out rats. And so they would breed dogs to be small enough to go down the rat hole, um, grab it. So if you wonder why they like to play with toys and they pick up the toy with their mouth and they shake it really hard, they're trying to break the rat's neck. That's what they were bred to do. Um, which it, 
is we took a natural instinct. They do that when they're hunting and we just bred it that, to do it to everything so that if they encounter a rat, they'll kill it. Uh, and then we train them to go down rat holes. And then after the rats left, because we got better at, you know, things like sanitation and not leaving our poop everywhere, um, they just became cute little pets. Any of you who've ever had a dog that uh, was originally a herd animal will know that if you're going for a walk, they'll try and herd you and make sure that you're all sticking together. Grew up with a, 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 a Laddie, Australian uh, sheepdog. Um, and if we wanted to bother Laddie, all we'd have to do is start walking five feet apart and then slowly increase our distance. It would drive Laddie insane because the herd is different. They had jobs, even if we don't use them for those jobs anymore. Animal breeding. Now, there's a difference between taming. This is not taming. Just to be clear. Because taming is when you take an individual and let it know you're not going to hurt it and it becomes friendly. But it is in no way the same as domestication. Domestication and when it has actually been bred for the traits that you want. So the best example I can give that is, sorry, what? Question? Um, there was a, you could call it tamed, uh, um, chimpanzee uh, um, at a particular zoo. Um, it liked to watch TV. I won't tell you what it was watching because it's disturbing to know, but it quite likes these shows that are produced by humans. Um, and it's, it's Carer who was very familiar with this chimpanzee um, and uh, um, knew it, came in and startled it. The chimpanzee leaped up, turned around, ripped his arm off, just pulled it right out of its socket because they're that strong. Um, and then when he realized it wasn't a threat, it was Carrie, he just put the arm down, turned around, went back to watching TV. And that's the difference between a tame animal and a, and a domesticated animal. A domesticated animal wouldn't have that instinct in it if we have bred it to be a pet. Because we've taken that out. We've actually bred it so that's no longer there. But a wild animal will always have the wild instincts. It may be tame, but it is still dangerous. A lion is not a pet, a domesticated pet. It's not the same as a cat. A lion, if the right instincts get triggered, will eat you. Whereas a cat will wait until you're dead, we think. I don't know, cats are a little weird. Mostly because they're not pack animals. Not to go into it too much, but you need the right kind of animal to domesticate. Dogs are pack animals. So all we did is we took the pack and we bred it so that it thinks we're its pack. Dogs kind of think they're humans. Psychologically and bred into them, they will accept us as one of their own. Whereas cats don't have packs. They have warrens, and they're all, but they're all individuals. They live together, but there's no leader. So there's nothing to breed there to tell them that we're the leader. So they just accept us as another stupid cat that goes unconscious all night and doesn't move. As I said, dogs were the first population. Um, we have evidence of 36,000 years ago, and very recently someone was proposing that uh, certain changes in, in uh, the genetics, um, this wasn't based on uh, fossil records, but, but genetic records, so there's some question about dating. It might even be much, much older than that. Sorry, what does that say? Dogs. dogs. Oh. Yeah. Or a dyslexic god. Um, the Eurasian gray wolf are now extinct. We don't have them around anymore. Um, so the common ancestor that all dogs come from aren't there. Here we have our pug with the weird eyes. And each continent had their own little individualized breeding program. And you know that that is just a very, very um, small summary of all the different dog breeds there are. And then people nowadays start doing things like I don't just want a purebred dog. I want a Labradoodle. Like, that's a breed of some kind. It's not. It's a Labrador and a, and a poodle. Um, 
But we're again looking for different things. You want the intelligence of a poodle and the friendliness of, of a Labrador. So let's see what, what you got. Labradors are known. Their temperament is really good. They're really, really friendly. Poodles are really smart. They were bred to be very smart hunting dogs, which is why if you own a poodle, especially one of the large ones, a standard poodle, they are insane. They are so smart, they get mental health problems. If you don't walk them all the time and play with them and give them a new and different environment to interact in, they'll get sad and they'll start doing weird things in your house. Uh, they'll rip apart stuff if they think you're ignoring them, so they're one of those dogs that'll destroy everything. But they'll also just go into depressions and stop eating. They will uh, they'll get anxious in weird situations. They do all the things that intelligent things do when their mental health isn't so good. Yeah. Oh, I don't know the answer to that question. That's a good question. I'll see if I can find out. Or if you find out in the next two minutes, let me know, and I'll put it up there. I don't know if we know that. But uh, we might be able to guess genetically, depending on how long the dogs have been around and changing. Okay, next. We've been doing it with cows. Ah, why you stop that? Um, you've seen a bison, yeah. and have you seen uh, some of the great? Uh, um, oh, I can't remember the word. like. Um, uh, a Eurasian like water cow can't remember what they're called there's like a cross like a furry version of that there's a, a, a gentleman who's been trying to breed back the original cow so he's been taking cows and trying to breed back traits for survival based on what he thinks it is and letting them uh, um, so let me get it I needed to look up the name and the name is aurochs there we go. Uh, yeah. So, original cow, giant horns, more like that. Uh, there's a skeleton of one. Um, there's evidence of aurochs, uh, um, wild ones in Europe. Um, the probably about three to four times larger than a current cow. Like they were huge. Um, and we also bred them to be smaller so that they don't kill us. Um, and, uh, and their horns go out like that. Um, and living in Europe, uh, um, in the medieval ages, uh, the last forest that seemed to have, uh, um, hosted them, uh, was cut down. And the wood sent away in a small bill to build part of London, um, as far as we can trace with the records. And no one's seen them since. So, yeah. Uh, I have a question. It kind of doesn't, it kind of goes over time right now, and it kind of doesn't. Okay, let's go. Woolly Mammoth. Well, first of all, the world needs more dinosaurs. Um, but uh, I, I, the whole Jurassic Park idea is probably unrealistic. The idea we could even get DNA, and then if you can get it to put it in something, is the most science fiction. But Woolly Mammoth DNA, there is someone who's proposed a way that they could do it. And I keep hearing reports like, oh, they've actually started. Then you'll dig down and you'll find that someone just referred to the original study where they said maybe they could and they tried it. Uh, and then they want to try it, but they haven't actually started it yet. But we can get access to woolly mammoth DNA. That is a species that we could reasonably maybe resurrect because we also have a host species. If you can get enough DNA together to make an egg, a fertilized egg, and put it together, and maybe there's some missing bits, but fill it in with some elephant DNA. They're close enough genetically that might work. And we have, you know, the Indian elephant is large enough. No, not the Indian elephant. The African elephant is large enough that maybe it could uh, um, surrogate mother uh, um, a um, woolly mammoth. Wouldn't it be what? 
Well, maybe, but maybe we could breed them to ride. That would be sweet. I mean, if we combined it with some genetic engineering, we made an oak tree that glowed in the dark on its leaves. Which This isn't evolution. This is CRISPR genetic manipulation. And the oak tree in a test tube during the night just glowed. Because we put in the, the gene for the firefly, luciferase, into the oak tree. And they, may, had, they had like hundreds of them. They could have made, we could right now have glowing fairy forests. And you know what they did with all those trees? What? They incinerated them. Why? You know, they get out to the environment and destroy the ecology. I don't know. Um, you know, can you imagine the impact on the species if all of a sudden predators can see? But on the other hand, glowing fairy forests, I think these are sacrifices we need to make. But yeah, uh, there's, and species that say have gone recently extinct, it may be possible to get their DNA together and get a host species to surrogate mother. The problem is that is a very technically challenging, and even if you get a few, once a species is down to a few individuals, you don't have enough genetic variation for them to really become a viable species. Um, you need variation to fight disease. And so one of the problems with all of this is that they're probably just going to go extinct again. It's much easier to save a population than it is to recreate that population. But I think, I think it's cool. Like, interesting biochemistry. Horses and elephants, of course, have been um, used for uh, manual labor. We've got cows, pigs, chickens. Or in that famous Homer quote, uh, um, yes, I'm vegetarian. I, I'm no longer going to have, uh, um, oh, you're not going to eat any animals? Yes. Uh, um, you're not going to eat ribs or bacon or chops. And she's like, this is Lisa, dad, that all comes from one animal. Oh, yeah, some magic animal. Pigs make so much different types of food. We've been breeding them for a fair while. And if you've ever seen the cute little ones on, on storybooks and TVs, they are also huge. They're about the size of three tables put together uh, lengthwise, maybe a little bigger and really wide. Um, the horror movies where they talk about how fast they could eat through a human, those are all true. Um, they can get very hungry. Um, dogs earliest. We've got sheep. Pig, cow, goat, cats a little later on. The humped cow, llama. Sent llama, important uh, source of wool as well as meat, alpaca. Um, the camels, one humped and two humped, are domesticated at different times. Chickens, not nearly as long as dogs. Turkeys, relatively recent. Um, and the duck, relatively recent in terms of breeding it specifically for food. The amount of different duck species that are bred just for decoration, even today. Um, I didn't know that uh, um, this existed in the world, but in different cultures, that's actually a big part of the tradition. Goldfish. Um, apparently, the reason why in um, North America I grew up with pictures of goldfish um, and people thought you put goldfish in a tiny little bowl is because some people went to another country um, Japan and saw goldfish in tiny little bowls and said, oh, that's how you keep goldfish and brought the practice back here. No, no, no. Apparently that's how they displayed their $10,000 goldfish. They're very expensive bred goldfish. You actually keep them in really large ponds. Um, it's very sad for them to be kept in tiny little um, containers. Okay. Plant breeding. Here's where we'll get to the evil plant. Almost all the plant foods uh, we grow are domesticated. Um, there's a few that aren't. Mushrooms are an example of ones that we still get quite a bit from the wild. Um, but the common mushroom you get in the grocery store is usually grown. But some varieties are very hard to domesticate. They're hard to grow indoors in the right environment. You still have to go out and hunt them. Um, but 
when you look at something like corn, going from this ancestor, which has a few kernels, to the corn we have today, which they are getting into the genetics and history of that where it was first domesticated in South America um, and just finding out it didn't take that many generations. They were really quite clever in their breeding. So they had usable, decent corn. Not quite like this standard, um, but much better than this fairly rapidly within 10 or 12 generations, which would have been a number of human generations. Um, and then we just keep growing to the point today, we are now trying to breed stronger stocks because the corn gets too heavy and destroys the plant because we can breed it to have so much uh, um, food on it. These types of plants, the grains, were probably the ones with nice big seeds that we could see that maybe we should we should grind those up and eat. Um, 12,000 years ago from Middle Eastern grasses. That's where all our wheats and stuff come from. And now we breed them for everything. Sometimes we eat their seeds, which are the grains and rice, peas, beans. There's no such thing as vegetables. You know, when they say eat your vegetables, there's, there's no, there's berries and there's fruit and there's tubers, which are the root. There's seeds, but a vegetable isn't a biological term. It's a term that your parents use to get you things that aren't so high in sugar, but it's not really, a, other than that, it's, they're all just stuff. We, of course, took fruit. If you took here, this is the original peach. 25 millimeters, so uh, um, two and a half centimeters. And now we have the artificial peach, uh, that's uh, um, 2014. The difference in size, huge. Sometimes we just like their leaves. Sometimes we like their roots. And if we're eating their roots, we're eating their tubers, the carrots, the beets, the potatoes. A lot of fruits are actually berries. A lot of the things you think of as berries are actually fruits. The scientific classification has nothing to do with your table classification. Um, intelligence is knowing that a tomato is a fruit, um, but wisdom is knowing that it doesn't go in a fruit salad. And we found one plant that was so evil we had to use it for everything. The type of mustard It tasted so bad, people decided we should use this for everything. So we bred it for its leaves and we got kale. We bred it for a part of its flower and we got broccoli. We um, bred it for another part of its flower and we got cauliflower. Um, different parts of its leaves and we got cabbage. Um, the, the seedlings when they first come out and we got Brussels sprouts. I don't even know what this one is, but I don't even want to try it. it looks like part of its root. Kale, the number one thing people used to use it for, was lining restaurant tables to show you the food they were going to serve. Nobody ate it. And then in the, I think it was the 90s, there was an advertising campaign about how healthy kale was for you. And now you can find kale salads everywhere. It's not actually technically edible as far as I'm concerned. Terrible stuff. Brussels sprouts. When I was a lad... Brussels sprouts were the most bitter thing you can eat. They were awful. And then sometime in the early 2000s, a farmer discovered a uh, ancestral type of, not really ancestral, but like a, um, a, uh, like a local farmer's version of Brussels sprouts. Um, so well, not one that's mass produced today, but it, it had a much sweeter taste. It wasn't nearly as bitter. He said, that's useful. So he took it and he bred it with the commercial one. 
Because the one that was used by the farmer, you couldn't ship it long distance. It would never survive. It just didn't have the characteristics you need to be able to distribute it as food. But he was able to breed them together to get a new Brussels sprout that had all the qualities he needed to ship it and wasn't nearly as bitter. So if you eat Brussels sprouts now and you're like, this isn't nearly as bad as my parents said it was, or Mr. Newfield said it was, it's yeah, because you have it easy. You have the best in, in uh, um, breeding available to you today. That's true for a lot of plants. They are constantly undergoing changes. Uh, sometimes not so good. Um, we're going to talk about some of the problems with this, and I'll mention the banana because um, that's a little sad. You'll never know the taste of a true banana. Modern agriculture. 11.45, I think we've got on track. To feed the planet, we need to be very specialized in our food production. You don't feed... What are we at now? Eight billion? Eight billion? I was going to say seven, and I knew that was wrong. Um, we don't feed eight billion people just because, you know, it happens by accident. It requires industrial farming to feed a lot of people. Um, and everybody needs calories. One of the easiest ways to farm is you plant one kind of plant because you need one type of machine uh, um, to gather it. But that leads to a monoculture. And sometimes the plants aren't even from seed, so they don't contain every, any genetic differences. Sometimes they're all genetic, genetically identical. If you've ever seen a watermelon, you'll know that there's seedless watermelons. So how do they grow those? Have you ever seen a seed inside of, of a banana? What are they? What part of the banana? Like yeah, those tiny little black things. They're completely infertile. You can't grow bananas from those seeds. The original banana had big black seeds with a little bit of pulp around them. And we bred it. And we found one day a mutation that basically gave us all the fruit and none of the seeds. And we're like, that tastes better. But how did we grow new ones? Anybody have an orchard? Yeah? You cut off a little bit of it and plant it in a separate thing. Yeah, take off a twig, plant it somewhere else. You now have a clone. That's the worst type of monoculture, is a field of clones. Why is this a problem? You've already answered one. Yes? And why would that be a problem? A disease that could wipe out one could wipe out all. Most susceptible disease. And so any, any environmental change is going to affect them very badly. Um, that happened with bananas. The bananas you, if you've ever tasted like really artificial banana and you're like, that doesn't taste like banana. And you're right, because it tastes like the old banana. The old banana that your grandparents, not your parents, grew up with was larger, sweeter, and had a bit of a more banana -y flavor. By all accounts, it was much better and superior than our current bananas. They still exist. If you live in parts of Florida, you can still find small gardens with them, but they all died out due to a fungus that attacks them. And if you start growing them in large amounts, they get wiped out again. We can't grow them anymore. As a monoculture, another disease evolved to take them out. So now we have a different type of uh, um, banana, and we, we run the same risk. If something evolves to take that one out, I don't know, eventually we'll eat those little tiny bananas that are in the store that I never buy and I don't know what they're for. And so we have that tension between trying to farm efficiently and getting as many calories out of the ground as we can. Now, of course, part of this is capitalism. The farmer wants to make or the corporation wants to make as much money as possible. But it's also a necessity. We want to use as little land as possible to make the most food. If we are using up lots of space to make food, it'll cost more than people can afford less food. One of the worst things that increased hunger world war, worldwide was the advent of organic uh, um, farming. Not because organic food is any worse than, than regular food, uh, but it used up more land and was more expensive. So farmers that would grow more calories grew less calories. Even if you're the people who wanted to purchase food 
weren't purchasing organic, that just raised the fr- price of food on average because now there's less farmers growing traditional food. That doesn't affect us very much, but it very much affected people in countries where food is a scarcity. They couldn't buy as much food. Um, we worry on a global scale about distributions because one of the things capitalism is really bad at is properly distributing the wealth. We won't see, be seizing any means of production today, but maybe tomorrow. Shh. We can't mention that. So it is very efficient. And produces more food than what's required. We actually, there doesn't need to be anybody going hungry in the world today. <coughs> we have enough food to feed everybody. Um, and we, we actually have enough food to feed everybody well. Um, we just don't get it to the places. Distribution is one of the most difficult parts of any system. Um, when the pandemic happened, there was uh, people who didn't have enough food. And there was people with, uh, there's farmers talking about their onion crop. It's just rotting they would take the onions in and then they just dumped it on the side and they would just rot there because no, they grew onions for restaurants. The restaurants all shut down. So they had nowhere for their food to go. And you're like, can you donate it to a food bank? Sure. They donated it to their local food bank in their farming town consisting of 170 people. Like someone's got to come pick up the food, deliver the food, take it to people who need it in a place far away because nobody in that town needs that many onions. And so it's the distribution often that, that where we're really falling down on is getting the food to the people who need it and to the people who can't afford it. But it's very good. We're very good at making food. I don't know if you pay attention to food prices. How many of you noticed that eggs went up in price by quite a bit? Everything went up. Everyone, everything went up. Water went up in price. Milk went up in price. Milk went up in price. Exit has turned out, they're like, oh, there's some problem with egg production. There wasn't. Someone went, I'll bet you if we increase the prices, people accept it. And they just raised their prices, and it worked. And then everybody else raised their prices, and now we're set at a new price. Yeah, I know. I heard that. Capitalism. I heard, I heard the um, production thing. Yeah. People were saying that eggs were like, there's some type of production issue with it. No, there wasn't. Yeah. Uh, it turns out that was manufactured by a couple of egg companies. Um a lot of our food is controlled by very few companies um, uh, for much the same reason. Um, if you know someone who needs an EpiPen, or, or I should put it this way, how much does an EpiPen cost nowadays? $100. Like 100 bucks. Um, four or five years ago, we could get them for about 55 bucks. They cost about 30 bucks to make. Um, they were really cheap to get them. We got the distribution now. But a, um, a company bought up all of the companies that make EpiPens. It's now basically a monopoly. And then they jacked their price. In the U.S., um, does anybody come from the U.S. know how much they cost there? EpiPens. They, at one point, they peaked at $400 per EpiPen. Yeah. And then some negotiations and, and rules, they got it back down to, I think, 200 but it could be lower now. Yeah. Like he was instead of he realized that pharmaceutical like products like medicine stuff like that was so expensive in the U.S. that he made it so that he bought it direct from he bought it direct from like manufacturing and he ended up getting like the price of like certain medicines was like four hundred like, like yeah yeah epi pens yeah and like asthma medication stuff like that and he was selling it for like on his website for like thirty forty dollars yeah showing just how much like a gap in market is how much like the government's kind of like how much each company. Yeah, or yeah it, there's, there's a huge market. If you can get a monopoly, you can make a huge... One of the problems living in Canada is that we have such a small population compared to other places. Like, we essentially have functional monopolies. Telephone systems are functional monopolies. They're called oligopies. Each telephone company makes an agreement with the other one that they won't compete in their area so they can keep prices high. And unless someone comes out and says, I'm going to compete, yeah. then they can just keep it high. Also, like, Canada has, like, the most expensive, like, um, Oh, yes. That's one of the reasons. We are a wide, broad country, 
um, and it's very easy with a low population, so it's very easy to capture our market. It doesn't require much investment from an outside uh, company. Um, some of the problem. hold it, it should say problems at the top. Modern milk agriculture and... Lax. Not too worried about their looks. So we should fill in something like problems here. So we need some genetic diversity. Uh, heritage species, that's the word I was looking for. Uh, we need some heritage species, uh, like the, the whole uh, broccoli example. Uh, not the broccoli example, uh, the Brussels sprout example. Having that heritage one with different traits really helped us out to make bro um, Brussels sprouts a little less disgusting. Not completely less disgusting, just a little less. Um, sometimes we select crops. Um, for their efficiency, again, capitalism, and not for their taste or nutrition. Yeah, one of those. An example of that is the red delicious apple. How many of you ever, how many of you like red delicious? How many of you have a variety of apple that you like more than the red delicious if you like apple? Yeah, it's because the red delicious is mealy, not great, but you know what it does do? It's bright red and it travels well. When the red delicious first came out, they were less red and they didn't travel well, but they, you know, quote unquote, swept the nation by storm. It was a variety produced by a particular farmer. They were incredibly good apples, very tasty. Everybody loved them. So they took them and said, you know, they're not traveling that well. So they bred them to have thicker skin. Um, more mealy inside, so it's tra which means that they travel better without bruising. Um, and their taste kind of went away. And now they're bought by schools and nursing homes and any other area where you can put out fruit for, here's some fruit where you don't care about the taste. You just need a really cheap apple. So we actually bred all the things we liked out of the Red Delicious. And we still call it the Red Delicious. And at one point... Farmers were paid not by how their apple tasted, but by how red the skin was. And so they also bred it to have super red skin. I was going to say, it's not always had with apples and bananas. I was really, they must get them for really cheap. Bananas are one of the cheapest fruits. Oh, yeah. Per pound. I noticed that. Like, um, when I went to Costco, like, every other fruit was really expensive. And then there was bananas where you buy it for, like... You know, like I don't know why bananas are so efficient to grow, but yeah. Yeah. And you've also, in terms of animals with um, efficient farming, when you're talking about plants, it's one thing. But as I said, I grew up on a farm. I grew up on a dairy farm. Uh, the cows went out in the field. Um, it was still an efficient farm, uh, but they had stalls. They had food. They had a place to lie down. We let them out on fields. Um, I would like to think that they're well taken care of, and we even had names for them or they are put into pens where they're never allowed to move and they have to stay there the entire time and that's the way they grow up sometimes the most efficient way of farming may not be the most moral way of farming and that's another thing we have to think about how we're farming all of these animals what kind of industrial farming um, if you know your local farm you can go and see if you don't know your local farm you can go and you don't know how they're growing them. Now, that being said, turkeys are pretty stupid. I worked on a turkey farm in which they, they, they said they were free range, as in they could go outside, and they could, but they never did because they were too dumb to go through the door. One day they got out. We had to go get them back in because it was raining, and they, modern bred turkeys are so dumb that if they look up, their beaks would fill with water and then they would start choking to death and die in the rain. Wild turkeys don't do that, but modern bred turkeys sometimes do. Yes? Secondary? 
There. Oh, taste or nutrition. I just put a slash there. Secondary. How much time do I have? Oh, not enough. There's one last film. Um, I want to talk about organic, um, but I'll show the um, Kirkstead video next day. Um, so we'll have maybe one little half bit of um, biology left. For the assignment last day, I wasn't here to answer questions on it. So I wanted to give you a tutorial day in between handing it in. Tutorial today is tomorrow. Uh, since we'll have one more biology day because I was sick rather than physics, maybe we'll use some of the next day to answer questions on this project. But I'd like you to start questions on this project tonight. You have a project. You're going to breed some dogs together. You can work with a partner. Oh, your head. Yeah, I, you can put it up there if you want. Oh, I probably got it. That's probably sitting in my mailbox. Oh, there's a, there's an assignment online. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's supposed to go to the classroom. Did you get my um my lab thing? The lab. I think you Yes, I did. Thank you. Thank you for that. I know that was a lot of notes. You are good stand-up people. Next day we will celebrate. I think this will require some. You do it in pairs. And I'm like, I'm you get class time for this? Did you get class time for this? I think next day I will give you some class time for it. But I think there might be questions, but I don't have enough time right now to answer any questions. But try and follow through the instructions, not try, follow through the instructions. The instructions, I think, are fairly clear. Oh, you already have one? Does anybody not have a handout? Did you put them all the way? You don't have to work with a partner, uh, but if you work in a group of three, I think some of it will get lost. So only two. No, no, everybody's putting them away. You have like five minutes right now to start. Read. Read. Because now I can answer their questions. I just know that I won't be here for next day. I will be here for next day. I mean, I won't be here for very long. So you could start reading rather than crocheting or knitting. Crocheting and knitting are the same thing. Let's do a vote. How many of you think that crocheting and knitting are the same thing? Yeah. There we go. Come on, Wait, Yes, they are. Uh, no. I think I've gathered enough worksheets and stuff. I'm not going to have a formal assignment on this section. I'm going to share it. But we are going to have a final one. So it'll come to both biology, chemistry, and physics. And they will emphasize biology and physics a little bit more. Yeah. We did a ton of squares. Uh, we did genetics. There's a ton of
a single oh. knit. Yeah, single hook knit knitting. It's not, it's not even a knit yeah. stitch. Oh, okay. No, we're not going to do an exam. It, uh, you know, we have done lots of workshops, so I think I've done enough evaluation of things. Um, what I, uh, um, and I thought, given timing right now in the end of the year and Regatta coming up, I talked to the other teachers. A lot of them aren't doing a uh, formal exam just for biology right now. We are going to have a final. So mostly we were worried that you've had at least one formal exam this year, so you've had practice, you guys had chemistry. Uh, some of the other classes might be doing biology because they didn't have it in chemistry. Um, and then we're going to have the final. Okay, and you. just use the other work on top of that. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Right. See you. Seeing you wear long pants is pretty unusual, Mr. Rufo. I was actually told I had to now. What? Yeah, dress code. I got... It's taken them, I was worried, the first day I started doing it, I'm like, some of you would tell me that I'll do it. And I got, I got away with it for six years, just wearing shorts every day. And finally someone was like, you have to wear pants as part of the school dress because it's not allowed to wear shorts anymore. So can't you keep wearing heels? I can technically, yes. Like that, wear shorts underneath. Same I, thing. I have to talk to the kilt makers because I've worn it a couple times. You're supposed to wear it like this hot. Yeah. But I find, especially when I'm doing something with a lab and moving around, it, not, it naturally wants to drift down. I want a belt and wear it here at times, and I want to wear it high at other times. So I have to contact the kilt makers to see if that's even possible. So or if they yell at me because I'm Scottish. Pardon? A belt and kilt? Yeah. Just so it stays up. Yeah. Belt well, no, kilts are supposed, supposed to have belts. Just wear yeah. the shorts on the kilt. It's the same thing. If you see a traditional kilt, I'll have a really thick, wide belt, which I got for mine. But even then, it's not, they don't have loops for it. It's just the tightness holds it on. Yeah. yeah. Elementary school, we would yeah. do like well, because like they would do like bagpipes and stuff that like yeah. assemblies and day. people coming down with the kilt. Have you ever seen someone put on a traditional kilt? <laughs> it's just a long piece of cloth, Probably. and they lie down and would essentially roll in a complicated <laughs> way into it. Yeah, it's, it's just a long huge time. long piece of cloth, which made a lot more sense because that's easier to make, and then you just do something complicated in the morning in the field to, to get into it. Mm. That makes sense. Yeah. 
Kilts. I haven't worn my kilt in a while. I need to do. Need to. I missed that. Okay, and I probably should stop recording now. <laughs>